All right. Welcome one and all. Thank you all of our wonderful expert panelists. Uh, really excited about all the, the talent and intelligence and, and of course beauty on our panel today. Um, we're going to start off with Nathan Schneider who is uh, one of just a few people who really coined the platform co-op uh, concept. Nathan, if you'd share with us what, what is a platform co-op? And Sure. Well, this basic idea is just a kind of fusion of the long, powerful tradition of uh, cooperative enterprise building democratic business models and the online economy that's increasingly uh, transitioning from being a cool toy that a few people play with uh, to the, the basic infrastructure of our economy. And, and the buy Twitter or we are Twitter idea comes out of that recognition of the role that Twitter has come to play as a kind of utility, right? I mean, this is the vehicle of black Twitter, of disaster data that, that information scientists and governments and, and relief agencies are relying on to know how to deliver uh, uh, aid in the case of a hurricane or, or an earthquake. It's also the, the mouthpiece for our president-elect uh, here in the United States to uh, troll uh, uh, private citizens. Um, but there is an important basic historical plausibility to the idea of merging, uh, of bringing cooperative business models into that um, space of a media utility. For instance, in 1846, when the Associated Press was founded, it was founded as a cooperative, uh, co-owned by different news agencies in different parts of uh, the country and the world that um, needed uh, a shared utility. And you kind of see the effect of that business model now in a moment of intense media polarization. AP, partly because of that business model, has remained a kind of necessary center um, uh, 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 providing uh, kind of basic facts in a moment of fake news. Uh, another feature that cooperative models introduce is they allow us to um, remove the friction of investor ownership, right? Remove that, uh, uh, that imperative for uh, a utility like Twitter to deliver uh, rapid investor profits. And it, it's that logic of investor profit that has made the question of Twitter's future a kind of spectator sport where uh, those of us who rely on it every day, I'm a journalist, I, I depend on Twitter for uh, information sources, conversation insight. Um, uh, 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 we, we can't afford for this to be a spectator sport. We can't afford to sit by and wait for Wall Street to decide uh, what to do with this essential utility. And so um, the idea of, uh, of a, a shared ownership model for an essential utility like this um, is so clear and so important. It's also very difficult. And, and I think um, uh, uh, at this point, you know, when I first wrote an article about the possibility of, of uh, buying Twitter for The Guardian, it, it, it was kind of a propaganda pitch, you know. It was an it was an attempt to get the idea into people's minds, uh, recognizing that considering the uh, the uh, inflated valuation of the company, uh, a, a short term buyout uh, would be fairly unlikely. Um, but what was really wonderful to see was the way in which many people actually took that call and started organizing very realistically. And if you look at these discussions that have happened in Lumio and on Slack, the people who come together to have this conversation understand that the valuation poses a problem and that there are all sorts of uh, uh, challenges wrapped around this question. But they're starting to figure out, okay, what can we do? Where can we start? And they're not starting from scratch. Uh, this is part of a much broader movement of platform cooperativism that has already built successful companies and is building more now. You can look at uh, a directory of this ecosystem uh, as much as we've been able to compile at least at uh, the Internet of Ownership, uh, now at IOO.coop. And uh, this is a, a resource that demonstrates just how uh, wide and varied and growing this movement is, and how uh, uh, maybe it is maybe the idea of building of buying Twitter seems a bit implausible today, uh, but the way we're growing and developing, it may not be uh, 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 before too long in the future. So I really look forward to this conversation. I think it's so important that we find ways to keep 
uh, this conversation moving forward and, and more importantly to find uh, uh, practical strategies for starting to build, even starting small, uh, uh, to reclaim ownership over the essential online economy uh, that we increasingly depend upon. Thanks so much, Nathan. That's really great. And absolutely, this is a really timely conversation what, with the Trump election and, you know, people looking at the, the data strategy that was used in, in ownership of our own data, as well as the ownership of, of our communications. And I think a lot of people forget that the UN declared uh, communication as a human right. Um, but with that, uh, I'll uh, introduce myself really quick. I'm John Guerin. Uh, I've been one of those organizers with the, the We Are Twitter collective. And for those of you who don't know, Lumio and Slack are, are communications platforms um, that have enabled the, the people to congregate around the Buy Twitter, We Are Twitter banner and, and start to, to do some work on these models. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have some of those folks in the room. And I'll, I'll give a quick shout out to uh, Matt Kropp, who's running our tech today. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, he's the Associate Director of the Vermont Center for Employee Ownership. Uh, and we also have on the call uh, Myra Sutton, uh, who is, oh, I'm going to butcher your, your title at Shareable. I'll let you <laughs> either share it. Or... Community Engagement Manager at Shareable. Uh, thank you. And Shareable is a wonderful publication for those who don't know. Uh, and now I'll have the panelists introduce themselves if we can keep introductions to about one minute. Uh, we'll start with uh, Chris Cook, if you would, sir. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me all right, guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I'm the only one from outside the US, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> my background is uh, 30 years in global markets. I was a director of what's now the biggest global energy exchange about 15 years ago. Um, I was asked by the former UK Minister of Defence after the financial crash, a little piece of work looking at more resilient, well, what, what does a more resilient financial system look like? And think the unthinkable, should we say, in terms of legal and financial structures. Um, see what's out there, see what used to be done before banks and joint stock companies even existed, and um, see if that's relevant for us today in terms of a more resilient financial system. And uh, in particular, my interest is in uh, utilities. So everything I've heard so far about utilities, I like. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thanks, Chris Cook. Moving to David Hammer. Hi. So first off, thanks for um, uh, for having me be part of this. It's a real pleasure. Um, so my name is Dave Hammer. I'm the executive director of the ICA Group. The ICA Group is uh, the United States' oldest national organization dedicated to uh, democratic employee ownership. So our work really is about bringing um, employee ownership in all of its forms, democratic employee ownership in all of its forms, to scale. So we do that through working with uh, small businesses that are looking to convert to employee ownership. Uh, we do that by working with um, uh, sort of the, the mainstream employee ownership community through employee stock ownership plans to create uh, democratic structures within those. Um, and we also work uh, across, the, uh, across the country in, uh, in various industries to try to um, use employee ownership as a strategy to improve um, the conditions of work. Um, so thinking in, in places like home care um, and in child care, especially right now, uh, how, how, the, how those strategies can work. So, but, but I'm here in the sense uh, um, to talk about um, sort of our role in helping convert uh, existing companies to co the cooperative form. And that's something we've been doing for really since our founding in uh, 1977. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Lamkin, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I am a technology litigator and a finance professional. For finance, I started at Morgan Stanley in 1998, then moved on to uh, CFO and finance duties for private foundations, uh, continuing to this day. Uh, as a technology lawyer, I specialize in uh, uh, patent litigation against uh, monetization entities. So in essence, I fight patent trolls for a living. In each of the, and uh, recently I'm the founder of Right Dog Capital, 
which is an entity that's working. It's a research institution and investing institution that tries to help democratize capital and bring capital to um, non-accredited investors, shall we say. All right, great. And Douglas Rushkoff, I'm gonna to toss it to you for both the intro and also if you'd, you'd paint the vision, paint the background a little bit for us. Why is this important? Why now? Okie doke. Um, I'm Douglas Rushkoff. I'm a, uh, I don't know, an old cyberpunk and, and psychedelics enthusiast who uh, thought the net was going to bring us, uh, you know, tremendous potential for uh, human cultural and social evolution on a, on a scale uh, unimagined previously and was in, surprised and, uh, and disappointed by how quickly the internet became the poster child for the uh, really the NASDAQ stock exchange and how quickly uh, uh, young developers were encouraged to pivot from their uh, wonderful ideas for applications and platforms to uh, monopolistic solutions that really just um, gave financiers and venture capitalists a way to profit off uh, people and places um, rather than to uh, promote economic activity of any kind. Um, and so I, you know, got more educated, became a PhD and a professor of digital economics and wrote a bunch of books, really looking at the, the history of corporatism and currency and how these values have become um, so naturalized that they're accepted as kind of pre-existing conditions of nature by the otherwise well-meaning business people who may want to bring uh, new ideas uh, to market. Uh, but it's, it's gotten us in a, in a, a, dangerous, uh, a dangerous position now where a, you know, you take a company like Twitter, which is a, a fabulous, as we all know, it's a fabulous little app, although it does have some biases that we need to look at socially in terms of uh, uh, what it encourages and uh, the kinds of conversations that can happen there and the kinds of conversations that can't. Um, I don't think it's, it's a perfect, it's not a perfect platform, but the uh, uh, bright young developers, uh, you know, folks like, uh, you know, Jack Dorsey and Evan Williams, they, they're really smart at how they make technology, but they're very rigid or brittle in the way that they imagine that technologies can be financed. So they've ended up with a company that makes $2 billion a year in revenue off a 140 character messaging app, but is considered an abject failure by Wall Street because they took too much VC. Um, for what the company is. And that's because the, the companies themselves um, have become the, the brand names on debt. So the object of the game is to raise as much money as you can and then you know, you essentially sell your company to a new round of investors who then help you pivot to the point where you can sell that company to another round of investors and so on. Um, so you're making money off the financialization of the enterprise rather than through the revenues of the enterprise. And most of the VCs you talk to will say, them, no, you do not want to make your money in revenue. You make your money by selling your stock, not by selling your good or your service. So it's an abstracted form um, of business. And the problem with that is, you know, when you go back to the traditional factors of production, it's recognizing capital as a factor of production, but it's no longer recognizing land and labor. You know, and this becomes particularly important when you're looking at, uh, at companies that can become monopolies because their, their services are, are so um, utilitarian in nature that we all kind of, uh, that we all um, sign on to them or we all use them and they get these great network effects. But uh, what happens when you recognize uh, the voice of capital at the table, but not the voice of land and labor, is you get climate change because you've externalized the environmental costs to the environment, and you get disenfranchised labor because they're um, just the uh, 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 well, they're just the employees and not uh, not recognized as stakeholders with a voice. Um, so you know the the communities of users, the communities of uh, of uh, of workers. And the, the communities or the, the 
globe where our, uh, our applications actually oper operate have to be brought back to the table. And I think that's part of why this notion of a platform cooperative, particularly in opposition or as a, as a, uh, as a counter argument to the platform monopoly um, is so exciting to people because we understand that uh, a company from Amazon to Uber to Twitter to PayPal to any of them, that the object of the game is for them to establish a platform monopoly in one vertical or one marketplace so they can then leverage that and take over another and take over another and another. And as we see more and more of our world privatized by these, uh, uh, you know, by these companies, we, we, start to look at, well, how can we bring ourselves back to the table? And one of the ways, of course, is to just buy back, as Nathan, as Nathan argued, which is buy back the company from them. Of course, we can't actually buy back Twitter at a valuation that's fair to us buyers and that would satisfy those sellers, not unless those sellers are realizing, oh, we're going bankrupt. This thing is almost over. We're going to have to sell it one tenth or one one hundredth of our, of our expectation. But at the same time, it's no reason why we can't begin thinking of ways to develop apps and alternatives and new platforms. I know it's been tried before, but never with quite as much consciousness maybe as we have now when, you know, diaspora went up or thought they were going to go up against Facebook, but then fell prey to the very same financialization. Um, we maybe were in a place now where we could say, look, 140 character messaging app is not that hard to make. Um, do we want to fork this thing? Do we want to build, um, build something else? And if we do, do we want to build it in such a way that it might not be so biased to the kinds of uh, uh, cultural extremism and trolling and bullying that we're seeing um, on the original platform? You know, there are 2.0s that, that we can imagine together. And, uh, you know, so I guess uh, uh, platform development and the business model development go hand in hand. And what, uh, what I'm encouraging, and I think panels like this ultimately encourage, is to start looking at business models as being as fungible as the platform itself. You know, we're so good at programming, but we look at the rules of corporate capitalism as if they're set in stone and not themselves programmed that are open to our, uh, our re-engineering and our reimagining. All right. Yeah. So with that, let's uh, pass it around each of our panelists, give each of you uh, three or four minutes kind of just to respond to, to Douglas Rushkoff's remarks and, and also just your thoughts on is buy Twitter viable? What does that look like financially? What are the financial models that can be part of an ecosystem that's that's programming our society in a in a better way? Uh, let's uh, just start again with with Chris Cook. Yeah, I mean, my starting point is very simple. Uh, shareholders don't share. They're fundamentally incapable of sharing because there's this dichotomy between the interests of the absolute divine right of capital stockholder, shareholder, and everybody else who's a cost. And um, we need to look outside this um, legal form and the instrument of the of the share, um, if we modify the share, in this country we have forms of company, uh, you've also got B corporations, as I understand it, which again are genetically modified forms of the, of, of the um, of, of length variety. But in my view, we need to look more widely. Um, firstly, at um, a risk and reward sharing models using um, frameworks like the LLC in the US and the LLP, we call it in the UK, very similar beasts. The flows through corporate, through corporate bodies can be um, distinguished between those who work there and, um, and those who actually uh, use it and those who invest in it. So that's one point that there are, there are frameworks or protocols for risk and reward sharing, which are not the joint stock company. In fact, I, I, do not, I think pathologically, is, is past its sell-by date. Um, second point is itself, and what I mean is you've got debt, you've got derivatives, you've got equity, which is shares in the joint stock company. But my research, um, I've gone way back before the banks even existed and joint companies existed, and, and, and looked and seen, well, what was there before they even did exist? And you come to a very simple um, instrument called a promise. 
basically I give you my promise, you accept it uh, in return for something valuable, and you then return that promise to me in payment for something I then have in the future. This is basically what's been around for 4,000 years and still is. And that instrument is still survives in the English language to this day. You've heard of the expression rate of return? Of, of course you have. It's the rate at which the promise can be returned to the, to the promiser. The expression comes from the rate over the time at which the promise can be returned. Uh, you've heard the expression stock. The tally stick and the half of the accounting tally stick instrument was called the stock. So when we're talking about stock exchange, we're talking about shares in a joint stock company. We're talking about loan stock, which is interest bearing. And if you look back, you actually see that this form of, it's like the dark energy of the financial system, the, the credit, they exist everywhere. Any, any time you actually give somebody a promise or a credit or a, you know, uh, you pay it forward, basically we're talking about paying it forward. So that is a mechanism for funding in the long term, which actually does not involve interest. It doesn't involve anything other than a payment for what I call money's worth rather than money. So I believe it's possible for Twitter to say, right, let's not buy it. Let's actually come to an agreement with Twitter that they become a member of an LR. On that, then we start saying, well, hey, how can we actually monetize literally with $1 Twitter credits or stock, um, you know, these are the sort of thinking, I'm, I've only got a, a minute to talk to you guys, but this is the sort of thinking which I believe, because it's also the past, okay? I've probably said more than my time's worth here, but that's where I'm coming from, from the perspective of resilience and back to the future. <clears throat> Great, and with that, we'll move to David Hammer bringing in the co-op conversion experience here in the States. Sure. So um, I think, you know, what, one of Chris's points is uh, that we, you know, looking, looking to the past is, I think, a really solid one because there's a lot of, um, uh, I think that there are a lot of sort of really useful and valuable lessons to be learned um, from things that have happened in the past and that, you know, this sort of, this, this new, new notion um, uh, of the stock corporation is, is a relatively, is, is actually a relatively new notion. Um, the, when, when I first heard about uh, the buy Twitter uh, campaign, um, my, you know, my reaction was, uh, and this is sort of what we do at ICA, where, where we, when we do co-op conversions, our first task is to figure out, is it feasible? And my reaction to, um, to, to this, this initiative was like, well, it's not feasible. And then I realized like, actually maybe it is feasible, but it may not be plausible. Um, and, that, and that those distinctions I think are actually kind of important. And so when you look at the sort of the feasibility side of this, right, just of like, like quite literally buying the company, um, what you find is that, you know, right now it's sort of the current valuation, right? At the current valuation for every like one, if for every 1% of users that buy were to buy stock in Twitter, um, you get about half a percentage of the value. Um, and so if you get, you know, if we want to think about kind of uh, acquiring $7 billion to get a majority of Twitter, right? That's probably not plausible. It's not impossible, right? It's not in, in, unfeasible to, for, uh, for, you know, to sort of pull together, um, uh, you know, a few million people to pool money um, and, you know, a relatively significant amount of money to make, um, uh, to sort of raise this issue as something that the company's board needs to address. Um, uh, but that I think what we need in order to do that is you need these institutions. And what we don't have in place right now in, in the US, and, and I don't think anywhere else really, is we don't have sort of the right kinds of institutions that allow us to pool our money. And I think you might want to ask a question, if you could pull, to, pull together seven billion dollars is twitter the place that you want to you know you want to deploy that right um i think that's an open question what i like about this sort of the buy twitter initiative is that this whole this whole uh, campaign is that it sort of raises this issue um that we need to make sure that 
our media channels are democratized, right? So, so when ICA comes to the perspective of a, of a business, why do we think employee ownership should be um, sort of a, uh, the sort of the standard form? Because we think that the governed um, should have a role in the governance, right? Um, that workers are governed by their companies and they should therefore by, di by right have a role in that governance. Um, and so we think about something like Twitter, right? Um, and our media communication systems that by dint of um, those existing, that the people who use them should have a right in, uh, in, in having a say. And so when I think about this, I look and say, is it practical to do that, right? Is, do we have a buyer who's willing to buy? And do we have a group of people, a seller who's like capable of, buy, of, of buying that? That's, that's a, you know, a big question. Um, uh, but what we do have is we have sort of an opportunity to create institutions um, that might be able to might be able to do that. Um, and so right now, you know, the, this, the notion that you can get like three million, five million, seven million people to pull together um, a twenty dollar investment um, and start having a real conversation um, as a you know an institutional shareholder with with Twitter, that's not a, an impossibility. Um, but it's not going to happen until we have institutions. So I, I really just am sort of thrilled that these kinds of conversations are happening and hoping that those institutions are the things that we're building. Uh, even if this initiative um, doesn't move forward, uh, we, have, we sort of have a platform for other initiatives like this, um, maybe of different scale, to continue to move forward. And David, I wonder if you'd speak just super briefly. Uh, you're probably familiar with the the investment clubs, uh, especially coming out of. Uh, I know there's one in Minneapolis that has a nonprofit. Would right. you speak a little bit towards that institution as a as a potential model for this? Right. So the the investment clubs are um, uh, are, are are really a, a, I think kind of a, 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 the kind of thing once again where on a small scale they can make a big difference, right? But that they have to operate at a scale. So what these are essentially are, um, are these sort of investment cooperatives. And so folks get together and they pool their money um, to make investments. And, and, um, and some, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different rules around how to do that and what the limitations are. Um, uh, but, but interestingly, there are, um, uh, you know, the structure actually creates some opportunities to do some pretty um, interesting and clever things. Um, and so there's, I know Matt, who is doing the tech, is sort of leading initiative to do one in Vermont. Um, uh, and maybe it's already happened, I don't know. But uh, there is a group in uh, Minneapolis that's doing it and that there are a number of these folks around um, uh, around the country that are, that are looking to do this. Um, and I don't, you know, this is sort of maybe something we should think about putting up on the um, uh, the platform co-op uh, website is sort of the link to all of these folks because I think it's really getting out that uh, that those 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 networks are strengthened by um, uh, people growing you know joining them. Um, so great, Rachel. What do you think? <laughs> well, as to the by Twitter project specifically, I think it's so highly improbable as to be statistically impossible um, from a legal and a financial standpoint. You know, Twitter, it's a down about six cents today, but the market cap is 14 billion. We'd have to come up with around 7.1, um, whether it's a hostile or non-hostile takeover. Um, I, I don't see that happening. What I, what I do think is really, really exciting is this dialogue, right? I think that as long as we rely on the largesse of governments and corporations, we're going to continue to have meaningless busy work as our occupations and that we have to start funding each other, finding each other, building ecosystems that empower us to create our own gigs. And that's really, for me, what platform cooperativism is about, even though the capitalist in me sort of shrugs at the word cooperativism. Um, you know, there are ways that we can do this right now. You know, um, what we need is an analytic system, maybe even built on the blockchain, to go to the companies, um, for example, the ones listed on Nathan's site, Internet of Ownership, build a blockchain or any CRM system that does business analytics on those, find out which ones work, and then go to investors, us investors, not Wall Street, not the banks, and say, look, we know these business are, uh, businesses are viable. Let's make more of them. So I think by Twitter, impossible. Platform cooperativism, 
completely necessary. Uh, again, 10 years from now, unless we all want to be robots or working for robots, we should make this work. Mm. And with your finance background, just really quick, Rachel, if you've been looking, I know, at, at many of the models that have been put out to, to buy Twitter, because this conversation, and we named that buy Twitter and beyond, really the sense that perhaps Twitter, right, very, very low chance to, towards impossibility, but other platforms will be coming on the market. I mean, right now, there's a lot of assets changing hands as baby boomers retire, but you know, these assets will be handed down over time and looking at that conversion piece. What, what are the financial tools that come to your mind that, that are readily available or need a closer look at or more development? It's a good question, John. I just, from a philosophical standpoint, you know, the word capitalism has become so broad that it's almost a meaningless term. But when I think about the assets of production, the assets of value being owned by the people that create it, that's what I think we need to return to. And so um, if you look at, um, I think Uber is a, <laughs> Uber is a challenge because we're going to have autonomous cars in five to 10 years at the, at the late, at the long tail. Um, but if you look at the 14 or so companies that are now currently trying to create Uber-like systems at the local level, you know, one thing to do with that, John, is to specifically study those 14 models, see what's working and what's not working, and then again, open source those business models. Um, we, have, we have the means to do this within us right now, and I, you know, I'm putting my thumb on this a little bit because, um, you know, Nate wrote an article called The Limits of Idealism, and I think it's an important article for everyone to read because we can't create anything unless we get real about how challenging it is to do it and that the products that we create have to have real world value. And that's a long way of saying, I think we should study what's already working in our communities, both old school brick and mortar co-ops, right? We've got a wealth of knowledge about old school brick and mortar co-ops. Let's hook it up to a CRM. Let's hook it up to an analytics blockchain and see what's working. And then we have some exciting new online cooperatives that we're just starting to take a look at. Again, let's systematically study them. The thing that's exciting about investors is we're greedy bastards, right? We're greedy. So if you show us a business model that works, if you show me 10 years for, in a brick and mortar co-op, you show me 10 years of profits, I'm going to invest in that. We can get the capital. So I just think we need to be a little more analytic in how we're looking at these business, businesses. We need to share them. And then we need to ask for capital among each other to finance the things that are working that create meaning. One more quick thing. I've just started doing a study of, um, I don't know if anybody's read the fantastic book, um, Shop Class as Soul Craft. One of the finest books uh, I've read, I read, Doug accepted on that course on that list. Um, and, but in essence, what he's saying is let's be craftsmen again. And so I've been studying a lot of crafts. I live near Napa Valley and there's a lot of people making crafts out of old wine barrels and we're studying how to bring those how to make those more successful how to bring those online i'll happily open source that so john i don't know if i i, I answered your question directly and if i didn't please ding me but i i, I think we have the resources among us to do this I, with that i'll pass it to to Rushkoff, uh, if you if you dig in Rushkoff and and redirect us if you will or did everybody go just Chris, I think Chris Cook's still with us. No, He's did everybody on. get to speak? Oh, I believe so. Unless Matt Crop, yeah. do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I'll 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 jump in with a few thoughts here. Um, so so from from my perspective, this has been really kind of exciting to watch, and I'm very very interested in the uh, in the kind of cat the, the 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 question of how we mobilize capital for these things. And, and in my day job, it's often looking at these small deals, few hundred thousand dollars, workers buying. The business from a retiring business owner and even in those cases um, it's often kind of putting together a jigsaw puzzle of capital to sort of make it work because you're dealing with people who maybe can't make personal guarantees because you know they've been making twelve dollars an hour up to that point um, but one thing in terms of this that I really wanted to kind of that I, I, I find the most interesting is kind of I think that there's like a short-term and long-term business model and that also that when thinking about the, the platform co-op thing generally I think a social network, whatever social network that might be, 
um, is extremely strategically important. Um, so the short-term business model that I see and the, the value proposition to the users to potentially get them to join um, has a bit of an educational component in that you know, so, so much of this, I mean, you know, going back to even the, the, the early days of cyberspace and um, the critics of cyberspace, like, you know, Humdog's classic essay about how even in the bulletin board era that users sort of sense of self were, was becoming commodified and, you know, resold to other users. And there's this kind of uh, this dark underbelly to the liberatory potential of the Internet. Um, and, you know, that that all seems very quaint in the in the days of, you know, Donald Trump being able to buy 220 million people's data and having four, an average of four to five data points per person um, to be able to exert quite enormous power, right? So I think we're kind of at this moment where people are starting to really actually understand that there is this invisible opaque power being enacted through these, these social media communications utilities that goes beyond just talking to each other. Um, and so I think that in the short term, like what if we were to go out to that user base and as, um, uh, as Dave was sort of talking about, like how would we get, you know, millions of people to potentially be willing to put $20 in towards something like this. I think kind of confronting that and uh, raising awareness of that sense of, disempower that, that sense of disempowerment and also sense of extraction. So in the short term, there's this question of, um, you know, of kind of pushing these platforms away from everything is free and we're not going to tell you how much you are, your profile, your persona online is worth um, into something that's kind of more of the Google model of sort of shared commodification. So you can, you could, choose to be cut in on the profits or you could choose to pay a small amount and you know have control over your data um, so I, so I think that idea of either collecting revenue for the content that you're generating or not um, uh, but but sort of paying a specific kind of transparent amount for that is is the short term thing the long term strategic thing is ultimately where do we find the user base where do we find the network effect for the twitters for or for the for the for the ubers for the airbnbs for all these other sectors of the economy that as we move forward, you know, it's it's going to be these platform monopolies or platform cooperatives. And I think that the um, that ultimately having a social network and the angling for something that that has that social network that can be the the user verification base that that then these different that can be the hub that these different platforms can, can plug into, um, and and ultimately derive their users from, but also kick revenue back to, so that ultimately the business model doesn't have to be data mining. But it can be the, um, the kind of a, a share of the revenue of all these other services that are that are offered to that network. So that's the long-term vision. I don't think that that's necessarily you know something that can be sold sold broadly. Um, but this question of ultimately, like if we can own this communications utility and we can then have some some clarity on what on how we're being extracted from and the choice to opt out of that extraction, both in terms of data and in terms of capital, um, I think is. Is, incre is an incredibly important element to sort of driving the individual sources of capital. And then, you know, that, that question of how do we build these institutions um, that can mobilize that additional capital, I think, is the other, the other prong, you know, the, perhaps a two-pronged approach. Yeah, there's a, uh, uh, the, the low price, high cost, you know, quality of a, of a Walmart, you know, it is, is even more extreme in online spaces where we, uh, you know, we want to get things for free now without realizing what the long-term costs are, both to ourselves and the businesses that we're trying to, uh, to get that from, you know, when every business has to rely on data and advertising uh, for some future uh, uh, fantasy exit strategy, um, that doesn't bode well for the companies or the future of those services either. Because as we all know, there's a data bubble coming when, when three quarters of Silicon Valley is pretending that they're going to sell their data at some point in the next few years. Um, so the, the questions I have are, are uh, let me, let me they're, they're all related. Let me pose them all together. Um, and, then, and then you guys can respond uh, as you like. Um, I, find it, I find it odd and even oddly refreshing that it's, it's now the progressives and the left that are arguing that businesses return to this idea of revenue. You know, it's sort of the idea that a business would have ongoing revenue dovetails very well with the, with the progressives agenda of sustainability because if a business has a, 
if there's a possible sustainable future for the business, that bodes well for the environment and for labor and for markets because the business won't have to keep extracting in order to grow. So, you know, the, the, the arguments I have, and I lose most of them, but the arguments I have with business people, with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies is generally arguing with them that if they really are a successful company, they should be able to be successful at their current size and that the obligation for them to grow in order for them to be functional um, is a problem, particularly if you're one of the four or five biggest companies in the world. So, you know, the, 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 Further, you know, in this in this kind of reversal of left right, um, or what I would hope was almost a disillusion of left right or pro business versus uh, pro progressives, I'm wondering if, um, dare I say it, the 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 Trump era, the sort of uh, momentary isolationist uh, 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 policies or approach. Of of the of the extreme right, um, this kind of protectionist urge may actually give us an opportunity to um, uh, develop business and uh, and markets from a different place. In other words, the the sort of the, the foundational principle of a revenue based business or of a circular economic. Um, uh, a, a circular economic sustainability is that there's boundaries of some kind. So, you know, when you look at models like the steel workers, where they, instead of investing their money in the S&P 500, they decided to invest their money in construction projects that hired steel workers, which was originally looked at as some kind of double, illegal double dipping, but it's really just looking at how can we um, develop some kind of multiplier effect, you know, and, and those initiatives um, don't have to be framed quite as lefty and progressive as we tend to frame these things. That the, this is basic business, the idea of you know, start a business with as little money as possible, generate revenue, make your customers rich, enrich the environment in which your business is operating so that you have wealthier consumers and happier everybody. Um, that's, not, uh, that's not a leftist goal. That's just that's just good business. So when you look at, say, uh, General Electric, which is leaving the era of Jack Welch and financialization behind and now getting involved in, oh, we're going to make washing machines again. We're going to make really good jet engines again. And how, you know, uh, the, the current CEO, CEO is moving towards that uh, a much more um, revenue-based, uh, a revenue-based sustainable future um, you know, I'm wondering if there if there are new possibilities for us not to be seeing the the uh, the businessman as the enemy, but the but business rather as a community that needs to be uh, reeducated a little bit about how to do good um, how to do good business that we're showing them an easier that we're showing them an easier way. So I guess my question is, do you think that there's an opportunity for a, a rapprochement? Here and do you think that the uh, uh, an all red government may actually uh, uh, give us an opportunity to do a, a bottom up real world local revenue based business in a way that maybe we couldn't when we were so open to the sort of global supranational uh, uh, neoliberal corporations. Can I jump in? Yeah, I yeah. was hoping you'd jump in. First. <laughs> <laughs> um, so much good stuff there. You know, I think at, at a high level, we, we all, whether those of us, you know, liberal lesbians that live on, on the West Coast um, have been clinging to a whole set of belief systems. Um, I am um, this. So with saying that, I hope this qualifies the next sentence I'm about to say. I'm super excited about a Trump presidency because... I think that all of us are going to get so many of our beliefs upended at a high level. I think it's critical that the left start to embrace some ideas that we've rejected historically. Um, and that includes the importance of capital. Um, now, 
that said, I think that we have to decouple, right? Most of my liberal friends here are also venture capitalists and CEOs. So, you know, that's already happening. But um, t the Twitter is a perfect example. The buy Twitter is a perfect example. One of the reasons I think the notion is undesirable is we shouldn't be trying to participate in the stock market, right? This is the very thing that we should try to get away from where CEOs are trapped in, an, in, a, in growth, are trapped in an earnings per share increase just to keep their stock level. All the executive bonuses are tied, their pay scale is tied to this growth at all means concept. And so we, I, my personal belief is we shouldn't be trying to acquire any companies that currently participate in the stock market. And if we were to buy Twitter, we should do a reverse EPO, uh, EP, IPO and take it off the market. Briefly, I think, again, that's why these co-ops these co are so exciting, because let's upend the business models and let's study the business models. One final thing, I think once many Trump supporters who voted for Trump because they thought they were going to receive jobs do not receive those jobs, we're going to have a real opportunity for coalition building, right? Let's come together and build jobs together and not rely on large S. Cool. We can keep going popcorn. So anybody jump in, David? Or... Sure. So so I so to the sort of question of like growth versus sustainability, um, you know, I, I actually think that's a really important uh, piece to sort of to unpack a little bit. So I think one of the things that I would would argue that we in the in the, especially in the sort of social enterprise or work co op space. Um, with a bunch, a bunch of the sort of startup folks, uh, there's not enough focus on growth. Um, that we need to be focused on growth because in order to get to sustainability, you have to hit a certain level of growth. And then the question is, okay, when you hit this certain level of growth, how do you maintain sustainability? So sort of, you know, there's a, there's a fantastic book by a company ICA helped convert to worker co-op um, uh, called Companies We Keep by John Abrams. And John's philosophy, I mean, they're a, they're a, a high-end um, design build firm um, uh, in on Martha's Vineyard, and 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 but John's philosophy is the the goal here is to maintain um, a business uh, that provides a decent living for all of the thirty or so um, workers, most of whom are um, the vast majority of whom are owners of that business, um, and those folks exist outside of Wall Street. I mean, I think there's this whole notion of like you know kind of. Where does financing come from? Where does finance, like Main Street businesses, they don't worry about Wall Street finance. They're financed by the SBA if they're getting outside financing or they're financed by their credit cards or by their a line of credit on their home, right? Um, we're not like the, the, the sort of quote unquote real business community is, is, is financing itself. Um, and so I think to Rachel's point around like, how do we get money into yeah. those folks, right? How do we build yeah. systems that get money into those folks' businesses, be they um, uh, co-ops or, or sort of any other kind of business that is sort of thinking and, and, and focused on, on sustainability? Um, I, would, I would just sort of add as, a, as another piece in terms of thinking about the, the issue of, of, a, of, a, of a conservative view, you know, and sort of the opportunity for, 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 for partnering with conservative uh, folks who are sort of, you know, have a, have a conservative um, uh, outlook um, politically, the, the business owners that we work with to sell their companies to their employees, um, uh, not all of them are Republicans, certain. None of them are. Uh, and they don't come at this because they believe in democracy and they don't believe in, they don't come to this because um, of some sort of, you know, so, so, social notion of what a cooperative is. They come to this because they want to ensure their legacy of what they've built, right? That their business doesn't go away, and they want to um, have people have responsibility for, um, you know, if uh, for 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 taking over this business. Um, and they don't have a lot of other options, right? Kids don't want to buy these businesses more and more, um, and uh, you know, the number of businesses that are going to come on the market so are 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 going to, you know, we are going to have a flood of businesses, small businesses, on the market um, in, you know. At some point, uh, it's it's not it's sort of an inevitability, you know, based upon demographics. Uh, 
So I think figuring out a message that appeals to what are predominantly, when you look at who owns businesses between 10 and 100 employees, it's um, white men who are over 55, right? That's who owns those businesses. So we better have a message around sort of how, you know, um, how, how this is a, a appealing to them because that's the, that's the customer. That's the person that needs to care about this. Um, so I think in that, in that sense, like, um, uh, a Republican administration, per, per, I don't know if it op offers up an opportunity, but I think the failures of the Republic, this particular admin, Republicans administration um, uh, to actually deliver for Main Street businesses is going to, uh, you know, I think hammer home that that idea that um, uh, they need, need something better. So, um, so, so what, quick, one quick thought on that, and then um, and then we have a question from the audience. Um, there's been some good conversation on the on that thread, um, but the uh, uh, so so one one thing that I think is going to be very interesting to see is uh, is particularly around the uh, this kind of infrastructure push, which um, was kind of brought up actually at the platform co-op conference recently, and there's a lot of chatter about that, um, and it seems like there's almost the potential for this kind of like strange alliance of the sort of populist Bernie Democrats and the sort of um, economic nationalist Trump Trump supporters who to align and you know I think on the co-op side there there might be some some kind of employee ownership type concessions that, that come out of a grand bargain on that front so I think we're in it seems like we're in a period of profound realignment and no one's quite sure of where all the chips are going to land at this point but you know there's it's important to be kind of keeping on the lookout for opportunities um, and so so the one of the questions we've gotten um, was uh, you know how how do you how do you feel about uh, distinguishing equity investment opportunities potentially with capped returns uh, from one person one vote cooperative governance which is um, which is you know kind of at the core of the co-op identity um, you know and, and in the traditional sort of capital structures that that question of power of governance power and ownership stake it tends to be you know um, distributed proportionally so um, uh, maybe uh, uh, David do you want to start on that. Sure. So, so I think that the, the key thing to understand the difference between return and um, uh, and is the difference between sort of a financial return and governance. That that one of the things that we do when we take um, a traditional corporate structure and we we form we form it into a cooperative is at the center of this is what we call the membership share and the membership share divorces. I mean, I liked, uh, I think it was Chris's, uh, the genetically modified term. I like that term. Uh, we divorce the, or separate out the sort of the governance role from the financial role. So the value of the firm is not tracked by the share. The share is a mechanism to decide governance issues and worker co-op, the way that's structured is the workers own the governing shares in terms of making strategic decisions and they rent capital, right? So sometimes they rent that capital through debt. Um, sometimes they rent that capital through issuing um, uh, uh, non-voting preferred shares. And sometimes they rent that capital through issuing a minority of the company to, um, to actually, you know, to, to, for, to, to voting shares. Um, but I think it, there, you know, within the sort of current US corporate structure, there is a mechanism to separate out the sort of this notion of governance from financial return and you know equal exchange is a really good example of this where they you know they have raised 16 million it's a you know not this is not a giant company but it's about 115 worker owners um, or 115 workers i don't know exactly the number of worker owners um and about you know i think 40 or 45 million dollars in revenue and they've been able to raise a significant um, amount of money uh issuing um, non-voting uh, equity, uh, and that allows them to, fu you know, fuel their growth and fuel what they want to do, um, and they just separate out those those two things. And I think that's sort of, you know, there's lots of like nuances of how you do that, but fundamentally, it's saying a share is two things: it's governance and it's a financial instrument. And let's separate out those two things um, and deal with them separately and deliberately. Yeah, I want to bring Myra into this too a, a little bit here. Um, particularly with, with sort of how we move forward with that. I mean, on the one hand, what we're doing is talking about, you know, uh, helping progressives um, understand business and revenue and profit and participation and that, that revenue isn't necessarily a dirty thing and being involved in business isn't bad, that it's not all going to be just, you know, the love barter rave burning man, you know, that we envision. 
Um, and on the other hand, it's a matter of helping people who are, um, who've, are who've, who've for centuries been employees of big companies where decisions are made for them to have them see, um, I hate to even call it this, but, but civic participation in their enterprise as uh, empowering and fun and something they're capable of doing rather than just oh, now I not only work, but now I have to understand the company and also vote on all the stuff it does. Um, and so how do we, how do you see as a community builder, how do you see us kind of building that kind of community without all of the artifacts of what we used to think of as sort of hippie left progressive or, you know, uh, boring, uh, uh, you know, union, union employee? Yeah. Um, I mean, as a, as a preface to this, um, I will say that I'm, uh, I come from this from the digital rights sphere. I was fighting the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and I definitely saw this failure of the system to represent um, users' interests with these major companies starting to join the, the trade debate um, and saying, oh, this is actually good for users and good for the internet, and obviously, you know, Google being able to put their servers wherever they want um, through the TPP is not really about users, it's actually about undermining national uh, mandates to pass privacy laws, things like that. And so I feel like um, the potential with platform cooperatives uh, and user ownership in uh, you know digital digital utilities essentially is to um, frame this not as a sort of a burden as you're sort of framing it, but as sort of um, a space to create freedom online for people to be empowered, to have a voice. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of questions about how um, if we do, if we are able to separate financial shares from um, or shares in a company from governance shares to financial, you know, capital, um, what does that governance aspect look like? Um, obviously, Twitter um, is sort of a toxic company because they have failed to deal with harassment for so long and trolling and all of that. And also, you know, um, ignored a lot of women and people of colors, you know, uh, requests to deal with these issues. And so um, I think that um, there is a opportunity to, you know, really do a lot of social innovation around this. But I think it really has to be framed as empowerment and freedom. And um, there are a lot of, you know, um, exciting uh, innovations around like smart contracts and blockchains and things like that. And um, I'm really excited to see how those things um, will progress. Um, but also, I think, um, as you know, the um, as you can see from this uh, live stream, you know, we're not very uh, diverse <laughs> culturally or um, or mm -hmm. ethnically. And so I feel like um, uh, I had alarm bells go off. I understood Rachel how you were saying that you know the Trump presidency does create exciting opportunities. Obviously, it is terrorizing and horrifying for many, many people who are might be targets of um, his, uh, his racial policies. Um, but I do think a major aspect of the platform co-op movement will have to be is thinking about how to put into the DNA or the, you know, the, yeah, the DNA of these companies and these platforms, not only in terms of of democratizing ownership and governance, but also putting into place ways to deal with, you know, entrenched um, inequalities and racial tensions and all kinds of things so that we, you know, it's not, you know, there's all this like talk about identity politics, fracturing the left, blah, blah, blah. But I think there is a way to be aware of difference and aware of, of um, inequalities and to build that into the DNA of these platforms or else I don't think these platforms will be um, sustainable in the long run. Right, as well as, you know, uh, not underestimating the, the work of those who went before us. And I gave a, a talk, I think it was at the 92nd Street Y about platform cooperatives and talking about all this. And a well-meaning Upper East Side, older woman, liberal, progressive said, well, yeah, all this stuff you're talking about is great. But, you know, of course, you know, you, you know, digitally aware, you know, wealthy white people can do these kind of cooperatives. What about the poor inner city black people? How could they do a cooperative? And I'm like, lady, 
Who do you think established the, the longest, most functional? You go to Philadelphia, you know, go to Brooke, go to the, go to, you don't know. I mean, <laughs> basically, it's we who need to take a lesson from, you know, from the folks that, that Esteban Kelly works with and, and, and other, uh, uh, you know, cooperative, co-op activists. I mean, you know, these are, these have been running a lot of them since the 70s. Um, you know, so there's a lot of lessons that we could take from them rather than, you know, thinking that, you know, that sitting in our, our you know, beautiful institutes, you know, that we're going to, you know, divine something from our, uh, our, uh, our digital know-how. And hopefully not mm -hmm. just taking lessons from them, but also obviously having them at the table. <laughs> and Yeah, right. <laughs> Definitely. Well, that's a good segue. And, and thanks, Mara, for bringing in that piece, the intercultural competence piece, which is so necessary. And I think just highlights too that like, we're talking about financial tools, but the financial can't be divided from the social. And, you know, we've had uh, decades of, of some very successful social justice movements and civil rights movements in this country. Um, and now it's really looking like we need to get some economic justice movements that are, are equally as successful and, and draw those lines across. And so I want to thank everybody for, for coming. I want to give everybody one last chance to, to make a remark if they have time, if they want to stay on. I know we're at the end of the hour. Um, but just a, a quick plug for anyone who wants to continue to be involved in, in these sorts of discussions uh, on developing there's folks looking at developing a, a platform acquisition cooperative, you know, looking down the road, maybe not Twitter possible, but other platforms that may come uh, available. Uh, please go to wearetwitter.global and uh, you can click a link uh, that says something about moving the efforts forward and there you'll find a link to the Lumio and the Slack or, uh, or find the contact info for myself or, or Matt or Myra. Um, and yeah, if any panelists want to want to make one last remark uh, as we go out here, I think, especially on action points and, and what does it look like uh, on a personal level, on an interpersonal level, and, and within our, our collective organizing efforts. I'll throw out an action point. Um, there, a, a lot of people are using the the election of Trump as an excuse to go into paralysis. You know, the business people I talk to say, oh, well, we're taking a wait and see attitude until we see how this administration does this or that, you know, because of interest rates or some old thing. And a lot of activists and progressives are, uh, you know, preemptively uh, moving into, uh, 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 you know, anti-fascism movements, you know, spending their time and energy, and it's fine, I guess, you know, uh, working, uh, making statements against what they perceive to be what's going to happen later, um, which is another form of paralysis as I see it. I think the, the, these moments, these shock moments, these transition moments when you want to freeze and wait and see are actually the moments that you should do the longest term thinking, not short term thinking. This is the moments when you can actually return to your compass or your map and 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 start to chart those sort of north star goals it's when the wobble is there that you have the opportunity to set a new course you know when when you're white water rafting and you hit hit the rapids don't pull your oar out of the water you put your oar in and row harder you know so this is actually the moment to go against that impulse um, and whether it's developing a platform cooperative or a long-term strategy or whatever it is, um, now is the time to actually build that rather than to refrain. Great. David or Rachel? No, I would just, I would echo Doug. You know, I think um, now is the time to be on the move. In, in investing, we say volatility is an opportunity. And Myra's point is, is well taken about how horrific this election appears for many people, you know, I have, we have a, a coming vice president that thinks my wife and I should be in jail. So I get that, but I, I strongly encourage us to calmly and level-headedly pick an issue and get in it. Dave? Uh, so I would, I think those are, those are sort of excellent points to, to, to end on. And I would, I would echo them that, that, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's, I don't think there's anything happy to, to be happy about with the Trump presidency. Um, but you look at, 
the sort of you know the the, the sort of the, the framework of like the shock doctrine that the left the right the right comes in and uses uh, crises to um, uh, and exploits them to for for their interests. I think there's an opportunity for us to do the same, um, and that's both like political crises, but also the financial crises that have these businesses, right? So. Um, so I would just say, you know, being, you know, having a have a long having a long view and 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 keeping your eye and sort of a uh, the sort of a, a the a long view prize is really critical. So awesome, Myra, Matt. I'll I'll throw in. Um, I was just recently ran across a post election keynote from the NASCO Institute, which is this kind of student co op organization um, given by Ed Whitfield, which is mm -hmm. truly like a great great talk and he's a he's a really inspiring organizer and he had one one framework that really stuck with me which is the, the, the rad so there's three things that are intertwined we need to be doing all of them there's resistance advocacy and doing do it for ourselves i think a lot of times like what doug was referring to that people can kind of get stuck in the resistance and advocacy rut um but yeah i, I see the platform co-op movement and the co-op movement in general as as the as one of those there's rare things where there's ex deep experience in that, how do we do it for ourselves? Um, and so getting involved in that, starting to sort of figure out how to build the capacity, how to pull the, um, pull the capital together, how to pull the sort of social capital together and the, the trust amongst groups that can actually potentially get the resources to make these sorts of conversions happen. And I'll just throw a plug again for that, um, the investment club idea and potential. And uh, if you look into co-op principle, I think that there's a lot of, um, a lot of base building power to be had in little groups of you know 15 to 100 people um, who are putting in money every month and building a base of capital that can be used for building these sorts of projects and, and fill the gap that I think in a lot of ways in the in the tech world is, uh, has been filled by kind of wealthy venture capitalists. But this is a way of doing that in a democratic way that also sort of builds a group of people who are conscious of that sort of long-term vision of what is what is a cooperative world and a cooperative economy look like. Um, one last point, I guess, is that uh, there are existing platforms that are um, that have these values embedded in it, which is like Lumio, and um, even they have struggle um, sustaining themselves. And um, you know, I feel like you know, by Twitter as a hashtag and a movement was really good at getting a lot of people activated and, and actually just expanding the imagination of what is possible with our digital platforms. Um, but obviously, we have discussed how unfeasible or unplausible that is. And I feel like um, maybe a next step beyond the, um, the crowd sort of equity investment group is to look at some infrastructural piece of the puzzle, like Lumio, and sort of organizing around that. Because it's, um, Lumio is such a great example, because it itself is a way to make decisions across a you know uh, many number of people all around the world and that's sort of the model that we have to move towards if we want to make something like a platform cooperative possible it are these innovative ways of governance and decision making um, and so uh, that is one I think um, two is you know as um, I am so happy that we had uh, you finance experts on this call I think um, have combining your expertise and thinking about how to make it very easy for everyday users to get involved um, at various levels is, is really going to be important. Like, you know, maybe it's just somebody tweeting about it or joining this live stream today, but then we want to be able to have people donate maybe $5 to use a product to $100 to $1,000. And thinking about, and obviously being part of the governance of those things and making it, um, you know, being a pleasure and uh, rewarding to be participate participating on those platforms, I think is really you know that sort of um, that feedback loop of 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 uh, celebrating and creating these platforms together. I think needs to be uh, created in in this movement from the very beginning. Awesome, yeah. Well, we've uh, we've got the education. I think we got the agitation. So go forth and organize, folks. Uh, now's the time. Uh, thanks you to everybody again for this great call. And the conversation will be ongoing, I'm sure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks all.